A New Babylon As the day of the glorification of the Holy Church approaches, however, a new edifice arises in the world, an edifice contradictory to the truth of Christ's building. This is the mystery Babylon. The actions of the ancients who dreamed of immortalizing themselves on earth, of creating a name for themselves, is being repeated. Today's Chaldeans, like those of former times, do not dream of having their names written in heaven, but rather of leaving a name and a memory of their deeds on earth. Here is a new Babylon in the fullness of the word, mixing truth with untruth. Instead of the clear light of the teaching of the Holy Church, founded on the Gospels, the prophets, apostles, fathers of the Church, and the councils, these new Babylonians thirst for apostate teachings and dark philosophical systems in which truth is mixed with lies and interwoven with untruth. This manner of thinking is the foundation of the new Babylon. One can guess what will eventually develop from this by looking at those man-created societies which lead to the confusion of people and of their understanding, just as occurred with ancient Babylon. The same fate awaits this new Babylon, however, as fell upon the ancient one, even though both of them claimed and claimed to be reaching for heaven. This tower of false teaching grows not merely daily, but even hourly. Great indeed is the danger of losing one's way on the path of salvation because of the spreading dust from this Babylonian construction of a monument to the dreamers and those who seek to inscribe their own names on earth. Where can one flee from this dust which blinds the eyes to the truth and fills the lungs with choking falsehoods? Where else if not to the peaceful shelter which is open and eternal, to the edifice erected, not by human hands, but by the Creator of the world Himself? Where else if not to the true Orthodox Church of Christ? How much better is it to be a nameless servant in God's house than to be an eminent and famous architect in this new Babylon, the end of which is utter ruin and damnation? The Kingdom of Heaven As we behold the stars in heaven, which light up the night and guide seafarers to safe harbors, let our minds be drawn to that special constellation of spiritual stars known as the Fathers of the Church, for they light up the night of the present darkness and help guide the soul to its port of destination, the kingdom of heaven. The Fathers teach the art of finding the path of salvation through the ever-thickening dust created by the Babylonian construction work. The kingdom of heaven which awaits those who persevere is beyond all human understanding, but the ways of God are not entirely hidden from us. We can and must believe in the eternal blessedness of the future as if we had seen it, heard it, and understood it with our minds, for everything in the natural realm points the way and testifies to the reality of the kingdom of heaven. The intolerable noise of the sea of life can detract our attention from God's kingdom and rivet our minds to this earthly sphere so much that we cease thinking about the future. Our faith becomes remote from the faith which is a foretaste of the joy of the future life so that we often feel an unaccountable fear at the thought of eternity, at the necessity of crossing over into the other world. This does not occur if the mind becomes used to being there with God instead of here in the world. A sinful condition hinders much of the freedom which is natural in the relationship between innocent children and their parents when there is no guilt which pushes the children away from paternal love. In order to delight in the hope of the future bliss, it is necessary to become like innocent children, removed from sin and everything vain and worldly, and particularly from life's pride. When sin and worldly considerations no longer separate one from the Father, the impossible becomes possible, and what the eye has not seen, nor the ear heard, and what has not yet even come to the mind, becomes accepted by the inner 
contemplative self, cleansing by tears of repentance. Then faith comes close to that condition which is a vision of what lies beyond death. To embrace, by meditative faith, the joy of the future life provides a great happiness and the aim of earthly life becomes more clear. All this troubled existence becomes more easy to endure with patience in the hope that the end is near, when the rewards of patience will make one not only forget these sufferings, but even regret that more was not endured. Amidst all the misfortunes and vicissitudes of life, it is not easy to philosophize about heavenly things. But in those respites which are offered from the trials of life's path, it is necessary to talk about the heavenly and to pray about the bliss of God's kingdom. In order to taste the spiritual struggle within oneself, it is necessary to call out to Christ our God and Savior for mercy. Fortunate are those who have maintained the habit of praying constantly. Blessed are they for whom prayer has become a second nature, so that even their breathing praises God. The most sweet name of Jesus Christ must be on our lips, in our breathing, even in our sleep, always and everywhere. Today, the great book of nature is being opened up more and more as a revelation about the Creator. Does it not speak most clearly about the unity of the Creator, about the unity of the Master and Lord, the Perfector and Provider of all? Where is there more calmness and peace than in the natural universe? In what family is there such good order as there is where the limitless Father arranges all matters Himself? It is evident that good order is possible only where there is one master and supervisor. The realm of nature also reveals to us the incomprehensible mystery of the Trinitarian unity of the Creator. The seal of this mystery lies engraved deep within the nature of all created things as a basic consciousness which glorifies the Holy Trinity. The omnipresence of God is also visible in His creation. Glance at the heavens, seated with numberless bodies, held in the spaces of the universe by an unseen hand. Look closely around you and ask, Whose hand is it that does not tire of maintaining the universe, in which all the bodies are spherical and expand out from the center in a great sphere? All these spherical formations, which have no visible point of beginning or ending, reflect the omnipresence, beginninglessness, and limitlessness of the Creator. Such a task is possible only for an all-perfect spirit, the Creator of all things. In fact, the Creator Himself has inscribed the image of His own beginningless and limitless divinity upon a multitude of creatures and things, of which some species are so small that there may be many millions of them in a glass of water. In order to maintain all this, God must be almighty and omnipresent, everywhere, at one and the same time. The Invisible World According to the teaching of the Holy Church, the spiritual world contains two types of spirits, God's angels, who, during the rebellion of Lucifer, chose, of their own free will, to remain obedient to the Creator thus retaining their estate forever, and the demons, these angels who were created good, but, by their personal will, became irrevocably evil, following Lucifer in his rebellion against God. Both God's angels and the demons are referred to as angels because this title does not signify a nature or state of being, but rather indicates a position. The title angel signifies a herald or a messenger. In this sense, the Holy Scripture also uses this title to refer to prophets and apostles, persons who were sent to announce God's will. The Holy Church teaches that the sole motive for the creation of the world was God's desire to have recipients for His endless love and mercy. The aim and purpose of the world is the glorification of the Creator. Being an all-perfect, an all-blessed essence, God cannot be in need of anything. 
He existed alone from all ages without the world, and he could have existed alone for all eternity if he himself had not deigned to create beings. God desired that men should appear as icons of himself, tasting the sweetness of existence and becoming partakers of his blessedness. Thus, man appeared, intelligent beings, inheritors of God's kingdom and glory through the grace of the adoption. In this kingdom, the source of blessedness is from eternal co-dwelling with the most blessed essence, God himself, and in constant participation in divine glory, to the degree that is possible for a created being. God, who knows the innermost depths of each person, will fulfill every mind and soul which is thirsting for truth and good. The measure by which the degree of perfection attained by moral beings can be ascertained is this. The higher the degree of perfection one attains, the greater and more all-encompassing becomes one's love for the Creator, and the more one strives to live as an icon and likeness of Him, becoming perfect in obedience to His holy will. On the other hand, moral beings which have turned away from the purpose of their existence, the glorification of their Creator, attain an opposite condition. This condition is eternal, moral death, a most fierce torment which results from the departure from God, the source of life and blessedness. There is a phenomenon of the material universe which provides a likeness of this eternal death. This is the total eclipse of the sun. This is a very rare occurrence and lasts only a few minutes, but it creates a profound impression on all living things. If the eclipse were to last for an indefinite time, then everything living would be subject to degeneration and a deathly decomposition. Every living thing would begin to return to the dust from which it was created. Such a slow, agonizing, degenerative death would be accompanied by much suffering as everything comes into confusion at the beginning of the eclipse, awaiting its ruin. For moral beings, there is a spiritual sun, the source of life and blessedness, God Himself, who called all things from non-existence into existence. If, for moral beings who live not only a physical but a spiritual life, there should occur a total eclipse of the spiritual sun, suffering, degeneration, and decay would become unavoidable. According to the properties of spiritual nature, such suffering cannot be temporary, for the spirit is deathless and eternal. This condition of eternal suffering is called a second death, eternal torment, an unquenchable fire, and an unsleeping worm. The last judgment will present to some moral beings the kingdom of eternal blessedness in the light of God's face, and to others a full eclipse of the countenance of God, from whom all life and blessedness flow. The Holy Orthodox Christian Church has always believed that the torments of hell will be eternal, understanding these torments to be those which will come upon moral beings who are cast out of God's presence after the final general judgment. This belief was formally expressed at the Fifth Ecumenical Council. Satan and His Angels From the concept of God as an all-perfect essence, it is evident that everything brought into being by Him was created good since He could not create evil. Where, then, did evil come from? From the pride of one of the highest spirits who developed such a high opinion of himself that he thought to become equal with his Creator. In an attempt to realize this desired equality, he enticed a multitude of other spirits to follow him in rebellion against God's will. Having been cast out of God's presence, and thereby becoming the Prince of Darkness, Satan desired to increase his following by seducing the first created humans into disobedience, thus increasing his own earthly principality. From ancient times, Christ's church has believed that the pride of one of the highest spirits was the cause for the arising of evil 
in both the spiritual and material world. The eternal salvation of mankind is closely connected with the deposition of Satan and the abolition of evil from the world. The inventor of evil, this enemy of God and mankind, described in the Holy Gospel as a murderer from the beginning, who does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a falsehood, he speaks what is natural to him, for he is a liar himself and the father of lies. John 8, 44. There have always existed opinions denying the personal existence of the devil and of evil spirits. Such an error is extremely dangerous for mankind because it leads him into a state of moral carelessness which leads to his own destruction. In fact, it is Satan himself who inspires man to disbelieve in him. Evil spirits have lost, irrevocably, all love toward God, and with that they have also lost the wisdom that comes from above, which is composed of verity, truth, and goodness. Why can the evil spirits not come to repentance? Because there are definite borders of obduracy beyond which there is no turning back to good. Not being subject to the temptations to which man is now subject, the angels fell deliberately, led by the false philosophy that full freedom is incomparably more desirable than obedience, the same philosophy which helped to create Protestantism. They hardened themselves so much in this erroneous idea that they preferred their rebellious passions to the blessedness of the angels which stood before God's throne in humility, meekness, and love. This bitter miscalculation reveals that even higher beings that have lost the divine light become extremely limited in the understanding of truth. As beings higher than man's spirit, They were gifted with higher abilities and strengths to stand firmly in the truth. They were gifted with a higher understanding of goodness and obedience to God's will. In spite of all this, the disastrous miscalculation took the upper hand and, at that very point, turning back to the truth was already impossible. Their state of evilness went beyond correction because these higher beings fell as a result of a stubborn and obdurate uprising against God himself. Warning mankind against such extreme hardness and uncorrectable evil, Christ told the Pharisees, Every sin and blasphemy of man can be forgiven men, but blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Matthew 12:31. The very nature of intelligent creatures carries within itself a need of divine worship, an inborn concept of God's grandeur and the knowledge that life is from God. In order to cast aside these inborn intuitions, one must exert force over one's personal nature. These intuitions do not merely vanish, they are forced out of one's nature, and this is what makes the sin unforgivable. If we rebel against the awareness of God in our own souls, we become God's enemies. Enmity with God is unforgivable, not because God's mercy has definite borders, but only because man, in forcibly turning away from God, can reach the outer limit of obduracy from which there is no recall. If man rejects the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit can no longer lead him to repent. The spirit of an intelligent being can soften only by the divine grace of God's spirit, but without this grace, it is consigned to pride and darkness. How great the enmity between Satan's principality and the kingdom of God as has been revealed to us in the revelations, especially at 12, 1-8 and 13, 14. According to the Holy Fathers, these words reveal to us that, In the last days, Satan will be allowed to make war against the saints of God, and the church, the woman vested in the sun, will flee away into the wilderness. These will be the very last times, and Satan will slay them. The Holy Church will have returned to the catacombs, becoming very small in the number of her members, 
and heavily persecuted. This terrible persecution, worse than that of Rome, will last for three and a half years and will end with the glorious second coming of Christ. Revelation 20, 7-12 Christ's church has been persecuted and oppressed in all ages by the prince of this world, but these oppressions have not always been so clearly defined. The first centuries of the church passed under open physical persecution, which ended with the triumph of the church. The next few centuries presented a more subtle, but infinitely more dangerous oppression of the church, the great heresies and false teachings. Satan attacked the lives of the members of the Holy Church first. Next, he attacked the dogmas of the faith, seeking to create disunity and to destroy the doctrines necessary for salvation. To be sure, in both periods, many souls abandoned the Holy Church and joined the ranks of Satan, but this second period ended in the triumph of orthodoxy. A third, more or less clearly defined period began with the rise of Satan's warrior Muhammad, and again the church was submitted to open physical persecution. During this period, the Orthodox Christian population of entire areas of the East was slaughtered for refusing to renounce Christ. It is notable that the Muslim conquest of the Orthodox Christian world took place at about the same time as the new and greatest heresies were arising in Western Europe, first papism, and then the paganistic Protestant sects, and finally such openly satanic cults as Freemasonry. This time, Satan began using both the former types of oppression against the Holy Church at the same time. A fourth period of heavy oppressions against the Holy Church followed closely behind the third, In addition to the new heresies, Satan began leading men into the anarchist and social revolution movements, attacking every social order on earth, striving to throw the world into a state of confusion, paving the way for Antichrist and the militant attempt to exterminate Christianity. The variety of temptations which comes from the devil is very great, and not all of them can be grasped by human understanding. It is known from the Holy Scripture that, with some unbelievers, he has blinded their minds to prevent them from seeing the light shed by the glad tidings of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, 2 Corinthians 4.4. While with others, upon whom the light has already shone, the devil comes and carries away the word from their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved, Luke 8.12. And again, as the righteous Job, he persecutes some with troubles, chains, and prison. As a defense against these oppressions, one must maintain a constant disposition of repentance, prayer, fasting, and spiritual vigilance over the heart. Christ the Savior commanded his disciples, Be vigilant and pray in order not to fall into temptation. Matthew 26, 41. In the past several decades, many people have ceased to hope on the kingdom of God and have turned to artificial means of attaining a paradisiacal kingdom. The Satan-created means include anarchy and social revolution. The special snare words which Satan has drawn into use in order to entice people into these movements include freedom, brotherhood, equality, and unity of mankind. How many are already following after these meaningless slogans, not caring who originated them or what the actual manifestations of these so-called humanitarian movements are? How clearly they are being led by the prince of this world, by artificial enticements, how quickly they are headed for the anarchy which will bring about the last tormentor of mankind. Antichrist. The beginning of the end of this world and of the earthly sojourn of Christ's church. According to the teaching of the Holy Scripture and the Holy Fathers of the Church, the end of the world and the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ will be heralded by a great, 
visible spread of lawlessness and impiety amongst all peoples, the completion of the preaching of the gospel throughout the world to all peoples, including to the Jews in a restored Israel, heavy physical misfortunes, and the coming of Antichrist and his struggle with Christ's holy church. The apostles once asked their divine master, Tell us, what sign will herald your coming and the end of the ages? Matthew 24, 3. The Savior replied, Take care that no one deceives you, because many will come using my name and saying, I am Christ, and they will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but the end will still not come. Nation will war against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in diverse places, but all this will only be the beginnings of the birth pangs. Then they will hand you over to be tortured and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. And then many will fall away. Men will betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise deceiving many, and with the increase of lawlessness, love in most men will grow cold. But the man who stands firm to the end will be saved. These glad tidings of the kingdom will be proclaimed to the whole world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. The Holy Fathers of the Church explain how these words point to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD as a prototype of the future greater tribulations when the full fury of this prophecy will be fulfilled in the last times. The fall of Jerusalem was symbolic of the end of the world, but terrible though it was, it was only a pale shadow of what is to come upon mankind at the very end. We must follow the interpretations of the Holy Fathers of the Church, observing the signs of the end of the world in these words of the Savior. From them we discover that, in the last times, the lawlessness of mankind will reach the extremity of its limits. Evil and hatred will rule the world. There will be neither love nor compassion amongst people for one another. Love will dry up, not completely, of course, but it will become cold in the majority of mankind. People will hate one another violently, will care only about themselves, and will try to do harm to their neighbors. In addition, many believers will begin to sway in their faith and some will follow after deceivers and false prophets, the forerunners of Antichrist. Lawlessness and impiety will become so great that people will not even notice the threatening forewarnings of the end of the world, which God will begin to send in the form of various physical troubles and subsequently in the person of Antichrist. As it was in Noah's day, so will it be when the Son of Man comes. For in those days before the flood, people were eating, drinking, taking wives, taking husbands, right up to the day Noah went into the ark, and they suspected nothing till the flood came and swept all away. It will be thus when the Son of Man comes. Matthew twenty four thirty seven to 40 In these words, the Savior clearly explains the condition of mankind at the end of time. We know that, just before the flood, the lawlessness and impiety of mankind was beyond measure. People were satiated with base pleasures and were blind and insensitive to everything spiritual. It will be the same before the end of the world. Unrestrained sensuality, lechery, gluttony, and drunkenness will become the norm, deadening man's mind so that even the troubles which God will send as a warning, famine, earthquakes, plagues, and finally the great agony of Antichrist, will create no feeling of fear or remorse in people drunken with their own corruption. The holy apostles teach that in the very last times, the various ruinous heresies and false teachings will multiply and gather great strength, while unbelief will increase. Mankind as a whole will be morally deaf and blind, and insensitive to everything that concerns its salvation. People will willingly believe any falsehood and will completely forget Christ's law. 
Every possible vice and error will be accepted by the world at large. Paul, in his epistle to the Thessalonians, says that when Antichrist appears, he will be allowed to entice many. There will be all sorts of miracles and a deceptive show of signs and portents and everything evil that can deceive those who are bound for destruction because they would not grasp the love of the truth which could have saved them. The reason why God will send a power to delude them and make them believe what is untrue is to condemn all those who refuse to believe in the truth and chose wickedness instead. 2 Thessalonians 2, 10-12 In his epistle to Timothy, the apostle instructs, You may be quite certain that in the last days there are going to be difficult times. People will be self-centered and grasping, boastful, arrogant and rude, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, irreligious, heartless and unappeasable. They will be slanderers, profligates, savages and enemies of everything that is good. They will be treacherous and reckless and demented by pride, preferring their own pleasure to God. They will keep up the outward appearance of religion, but will have rejected the inner power of it. Have nothing to do with people like that. 2 Timothy 3, 1-5 Of course, all these vices have always been present in the world, but in the last days their power over mankind will become almost absolute, so that people will become even more insensitive willfully suppressing all the good inclinations within themselves and following only the inclinations of their passions. Once the gospel has been preached throughout the entire world, amongst all peoples, mankind will be all the more guilty and unjustifiable at the dread judgment. The evangelization of the whole world will be completed with the preaching of the gospel to the Jews in a restored Israel. If we read the words of our Lord recorded in Matthew 24, 14, we can see that the completion of the evangelization of the entire world is the sign nearest to the end of the ages and the second glorious coming of Christ. But the majority of mankind will remain deaf and dumb to the preaching of the gospel and will not listen to the truth, but will refuse it, listening instead to the voice of their own passions.